Okay, let's get started. Today, we're gonna do the final review for module two. So the, this module is about gene regulation. We started the module by looking at transcription factor motifs in um, genomes, basically, there are transcription factors that recognize specific sequence motifs or sequence patterns that will bind to the, the DNA and then regulate the nearby gene expression. In species such as bacteria or yeast, transcription factor motifs are extremely important in understanding. You, you can almost get good enough information to understand how transcription factors regulate nearby gene expression by looking at the, the motifs. And so we talk about sequence logo and um, um, recently in species such as human mouse, there are also databases of different transcription factor motifs such as Jasper and Homer factor book and probably the most updated completed collection is this uh, database called Hokomoko. Um, if you don't have the motif information, you have to do de novo motif finding. Um, we also discussed a number of tools and depend on the representation of the motif you want to look for. Um, so you can represent a motif just with regular expression. So this is just, you know, you, you, you enumerate all the possible nucleotide uh, camer patterns and then try to see which type of patterns are enriched in the data you have compared to some background. But a more informative type of motif representation is probably this sequence logo type, which is a position weight matrix model, which gives you better sense of which positions are more important, what bases are preferred than other bases in each location. And with the motif type of matrix, uh, motif uh, matrix type of representation, we we also introduced two different type of computational algorithm. One is expectation maximization. This is a meme. Remember, this is you iteratively update the motif matrix and um, score using this motif to score the all the sequences for the likelihood of being a hit. But this is a deterministic method. Therefore, we also introduce Gibbs sampler. This is a stochastic approach. So remember in the lecture, we talk about having to revote for congressmen and how that would change. It will probably converge on some enriched sequence patterns in your input data, but it's not completely deterministic. Um, so even with these type of algorithms, with um, genomes such as human mouse that are fairly complex with very long non-coding uh, sequence, compared to a very short, uh, small percentage of coding sequences, motif finding is still a very, very difficult problem. And so for, I guess, 20 years ago, many, many groups devoted a lot of efforts on motif finding. And um, they, in order to improve the motif finding power, people also use evolutionary conservation between species to narrow down on the search space. They also look for motif modules. Basically, these are redundant motif hits and com combinatorial motif hits that are clustered in the region and try to only focus the uh, search space, uh, small search space for motif finding in order to improve the signal to noise. Um, a lot of these approaches have been tried with varying degree of success, but, but what really helped is really uh, chip seek or early day was chip chip, later on was high throughput sequencing, it was chip seek. Basically, if you have an antibody against the transcription factor of interest, you can now use chip seek to identify genome wide where this factor binds um, in a single experiment. And at the end, you get a whole bunch of FASTQ file, right? We talk about how to analyze the chip seek data. We can use BWA for read mapping, we can use MAX for peak calling. And then uh, with ChIP-seq, you need to really QC the quality because there are a lot of um, RNA-seq. I think most people can get good quality sample, but ChIP-seq, many high-profile papers have bad quality ChIP-seq data, mostly due to the availability of the antibodies and also the starting material of the cells. And so people look at PBC, this is look at how many times you read the same reads over and over again. Um, you can look at the FDR of um, all your peak calls to make sure that you're calling enough peaks 
compared to the controls, not the other way around. Um, you can look at the total number of peaks with a certain fault change, because if you sequence very deep, uh, you always have a lot more peaks, but the, the peaks that have over fivefold is, is probably more will plateau with sequencing reads. Um, we also talk about the fraction of reads in the peaks, which tell us the signal to noise, and whether the peaks overlap with the known DNA's hypersensitivity peaks that people have done experiments before, because um, DNA's or chromatin accessibility regions are the collection of all the transcription factor binding sites in the, in the genome. And so if you do a real chip seek and over like 90% of the peaks overlap with previous DNAs, that's a good indication that at least you're hitting some right regions in the genome. We can also look at evolutionary conservation of the peaks and see whether the correct motif for the transcription factor is really enriched in the peak regions. And so yeah, this is in case you know, people use a wrong antibody, you will still get the right peaks. Well, you will still get a lot of good peaks, but from the motif, you will know that it's not really enriching on the right transcription factor. And so QC is very important in ChIP-seq, and we have this database called SysromDB, which we collected and processed qc um, as much as possible. We published uh, ChIP-seq uh, and uh, chromatin accessibility data in human and mouse. Um, we can also use ChIP-seq data to look at transcription factor interactions with each other. And the first level is you can do this by motif enrichment. If you do chip seek of one factor, but in the motif analysis, you always find the uh, uh, transcription factor motif itself, but also many other transcription factors that indicate that your transcription factor might be interacting with other, other transcription factors in, in those binding sites. I see a question. Uh, so the question is, I have a question about Systrom DB. What is the GIGO score and how is it calculated and what does it represent? Yeah, so basically, if you have a, um, a particular peak list, you can run the uh, GIGO to look for all the other ship seek based on your input data to measure whether some data are similar to yours. Um, so the score actually represent the level of overlap of another data with your data. And so if you do all pairwise, it's actually not really comparable because um, depending on the peak least size, the scores are not comparable. But if you have your input data comparing with all the other data, that score is comparable and will give you um, kind of the rank ordered hits of um, what other chipsy data overlap with your own. Okay, um, it, it just kind of show you um, whether your list is related to some other profile that people have done before. So chip seek is a much harder experiment to do than things like RNA seek. There are very few core facilities that can do a chip seek for you, and they are quite expensive. Whereas RNA seek, as we mentioned nowadays, you know, we're we're getting deals at like one hundred sixty dollars for RNA seek sample. Um, and so if people have good quality chip seek, it's still very, very useful. Um, so yeah, so we can use motif enrichment. We can also use chip seek peak overlap. Basically, um, if you have a chip seek, you overlap with all the other chip seek data, um, maybe that will also tell you what your factor might be uh, interacting with other transcription factors in the particular cell type. Um, very often, chip seek is done together um, with gene expression. And people want to ask, what is my transcription factor doing in regulating nearby genes? And so for that, um, because nowadays when people do chip seek, it's, an, it's not uncommon for them to see only three or five or 10% of the binding sites that really lands even um, within two to three KB of the transcription star site. So the vast majority of binding sites for transcription factors can be quite far away from genes. And so um, over the years, what we have found to be a reasonable way to identify targets for a gene is if you look at all the peaks near a gene, um, you can just use this regulatory potential, which measures all the peaks nearby within say a hundred KB region um, and weight all the peaks based on 
the distance of this peak to the transcription start site of the gene with the exponential decay. So things that are really close by will be counted a lot, whereas if it's really further away, they will be weighted lower and lower. And you sum up all the peaks um, and then calculate a score on a particular gene. Um, especially if this gene has a open chromatin on the transcription start site to mean that this gene is at least transcribed in that cell, then it's more likely to be a real target. And so um, we use the regulatory potential weighted by the distance to, to at least give us some evidence that from binding, this gene might be a target for the TF. We also very often look at the differential expression. For example, if you compare the RNA-seq of a cell when the factor is active versus the RNA-seq of a, another cell when the factor is not active, right, with either an overexpression, knockdown, or like hormone stimulation or some kind of a drug tr treatment, and you compare the two uh, differential expression uh, between the TF active and TF inactive, you get differential expression, which also indicate that this factor might be related to those differentially expressed genes. And then you can combine these two, uh, the rank order of the differential expression and rank order from the regulatory potential to give you the, the target genes. And once you get the target genes, uh, by the way, we usually do this separately for upregulated genes and downregulated genes. And at, at the end, you can run gene ontology or uh, gene set enrichment to look at whether there's function enrichment for the derived targets. Okay, so that's ChIP-seq. Um, and then we started talking about epigenetics. Um, yeah, so the initial, I guess, motivation for a lot of people interested in epigenetics is when you look at the transcription factor, they bind the DNA just by recognizing the DNA sequence, the motif sequence. But if you compare the ChIP-seq data in many different cells, clearly they, they bind to very different regions. And so why that is the case, epigenetics come into uh, play here. In the different cells, the epigenetics are different. Uh, every cell has a memory of its identity. And depending on the cell identity, it influence where transcription factors can bind. Um, of course, epigenetics also have the cross-generational things, you know, how a parents going through a famine can influence whether the, the child has obesity in the next generation. So that, that's kind of a slightly different question. Most people um, studying epigenetics are looking at um, the cell developmental process, disease status, and the cell lineage, and things like that. Um, there are many different levels of epigenetics. The very first is DNA methylation. This happens on the C, uh, G region on the uh, DNA, at least in, in human. It's mostly C followed by a G, and that C can be methylated. Um, and this methylation has a, a most, mostly a function of silencing the, the, the chromatin around that region. And so um, the early days, people believe DNA methylation is a um, non-reversible process. And for demethylation, you have to cut out that piece of methylated DNA and then insert the unmethylated DNA back. But later on, there are demethylation enzymes discovered, and so people now know this is a reversible process. It can really happen in, on the chromatin. The DNA can be methylated or demethylated. And in order to really profile those locations, um, for this course, we focus on sequencing-based approach, and uh, the most kind of high-resolution good quality data is this bisulfide sequencing, where we will treat the DNA with the bisulfide reagent. And this region, if it's not methylated, that, that C will be converted into a T. And then you, you sequence the bisulfide treated and the unbisulfide treated DNA, you will be able to know which regions are methylated or not. Now you can also just compare to the reference genome. Um, and so, but the difficulty here is that the sequencing data, because the C, can be converted to a T if it's unmethylated. Read mapping is a lot more complicated. So we talk about uh, um, bisulfide sequencing read mapping and how you can distinguish between really a methylated, uh, the unmethylated C converting to a T or a nucleotide change in the genome that is really just a T in the, in the genome. Um, and so um, after you do the read mapping at each location based on the the C's versus the T's in that location, you can estimate the percent of methylation in each location. 
And what we found when people are profiling different cells is that methylation usually within the same cell are, are mostly mm, dichotomous, uh, which means that if you profile the same type of cells, they're growing kind of similarly, you look at each location, most of the regions in the genome are either completely methylated or completely unmethylated. The big difference uh, between their, uh, the, 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 the exception is those um, uh, imprinted region where the mother and father are giving the child uh, two copies of the DNA and they have differential methylation regions. And in the genome, there are only about 100 such regions available. Um, another property of DNA methylation is that it spreads. So very often nearby CPG regions will have similar um, uh, methylation patterns. So if your read coverage on a sp uh, small region is not very accurate, you can use nearby CG regions to help you estimate the overall methylation level. Um, in terms of the function of uh, DNA methylation, it mostly considered as having a repressive function. Basically, um, there are many, many repetitive regions in the genome. A lot of them were from previous viral infection, ritual transposon insertion, but these you know, viral inf infection genome incorporation and um, repeat sequence are actually not good um, if they jump around. And so DNA methylation is to go there, cover it up, and kind of do not allow those repetitive sequences from being expressed again in the genome. Um, in, uh, in CPG island that are near genes, uh, DNA methylation also serve the role of silencing the gene. So if the CPG island near the transcription start site are methylated, then that nearby gene will not be expressed. However, people also found that um, if a gene is expressed, the promoter CPG island is usually unmethylated but the gene body of highly expressed genes can be methylated. And there are studies showing that those gene body methylation is to ensure that polymerase two don't go start a transcription in the wrong place. Instead, they go to the correct beginning of the gene to start elongation. There are also a lot of DNA methylation that happens on the enhancers, and that's where a lot of the demethylation happens very actively. Um, um, some transcription factors could recognize um, unmethylated DNA, um, or, and some other ones can recognize the methylated DNA, but recruit the methylation enzymes to demethylate DNA, open up the chromatin, allowing other transcription factors to bind there. Um, and DNA methylation has been found to be misregulated in many different diseases. A very uh, common observation in cancer is that a lot of these repetitive regions in the genome are now hypomethylated. So a lot of repeats are now getting, or, or ritual transposon are getting activated. And, and yet some of the important genes that should be expressed with a regular gene um, because of their CPG promoter hypermethylation are now being suppressed. And so um, that's something people observe. And uh, there are a lot of other kind of epigenetic changes on the DNA methylation in other disease or, or developmental processes. For nucleus on positioning, um, so you can see here, DNA methylation happens just on the double-stranded DNA, um, but the chromatin um, is actually packaged into uh, kind of different structures. And the very first level of the chromatin, or the unit, basic unit of the chromatin, is nucleosome. So this consists of 147 nucleotide wrapped around uh, eight histone proteins. So that's the basic unit. Um, and so very often, DNAs that's wrapped around nucleosomes prevent transcription factor from binding to this. The exception is pioneering factors. A lot of the pioneering transcription factors can really go to the nucleosome DNA, um, squeeze out the nucleosome, open up the chromatin so that the nucleosome-free region can then be available for other transcription factors to go there and bind and start like influence transcription. And so to know where the, these, these nucleosomes are, people use the uh, uh, MNAs to really cut out the, those nucleosome-free regions to only sequence out where the nucleosomal DNAs are. And so you can map out where nucleosomes are in the genome. And this is usually done in the cell population. And what people observed is um, um, there are this rotational position, which you know, 
basically because the genome has 10 base pair GC uh, periodicity, a nucleosome is usually happy when it's like this, but not happy when it's like this, right? So even within 10 base pair, if it just shift a little bit, then all the GCs are aligned well because the um, ATs don't like histones. The GC likes to, the histones, so they want to be in the inside of the DNA to, to round up a um, double, the, sorry, the, the wrap around the, the histone protein. So um, nucleosomes are positioned so that the GC are facing inside at more and the ATs are facing outside more. Um, but that's kind of a very small shift. Whereas for statistical positioning, this is mostly transcription factor binding. And for that, a whole nucleosome can be squeezed out and you have like 150 base pair region that's nucleosome free and opening up to other transcription factors to binding. In addition, once this region is open and transcription factors are binding there, the nearby nucleosomes are much more positioned. And you will see this really good periodicity in the, in the now it's like a, 150 base pair, another one in 100, maybe 60 base pair, and then another one 150, 60 base pair away. And so for that, it's, a, it's statistical positioning. And that's based on uh, transcription factor binding. And that's actually more important. Looking at the nucleosome dynamics on the statistical positioning, you can also predict whether transcription factors are binding. Um, next level of epigenetics is histone modification. Um, uh, there is a theory of histone code, which means uh, depending on the different histone marks, they have different enrichment in the genome. We remember some of the histone marks are enriching a promoter, some are enriching an enhancer, some are enriched on the gene, uh, whole, uh, the axons of genes. They all have different functions. And so in combination of the, all the histone modifications, they establish the epigenetic landscape of the cell. And in combination, they control where transcription factor prefer to bind. Um, and also what kind of genes are expressed and the cell will remember its lineage. Um, so there are enzymes in the genome that can read, write, or erase either DNA modification or histone modification. There are also enzymes that are involved in positioning where the nucleosomes are. So these are chromatin regulators. Um, and for histone marks, people can also do chip seek of the histone marks. And that's not done directly um, on the DNA. It's through cross-linking, we cross-link the histones to the, DNA, to the chromatin, to the DNA. And then we use the antibody against the specific histone mark to pull down the, the histone. And then the DNA will, will also come down. So the resolution of the histone marks is not as good as the chip seek uh, of transcription factors. Um, and, but these are very, very important land posts for transcription fa factor binding, for gene regulation, for gene expression. And so we can use histone marks to annotate the cells for many things. So for example, we can use histone marks to identify new genes if they have the right promoter mark and the transcription elongation mark. We can use it to figure out which genes are more important. For example, if they have uh, uh, both K27 uh, trimethylation and K4 trimethylation in the stem cell, you, it means that the cell needs to have both the break and the, the, the gas pedal. Those genes are more important. You need tighter regulation. People also found these uh, super enhancers or super promoters that have very, very strong K27 acetylation or K4 trimethylation, um, which indicate that those are also epigenetically stabilized to be expressed in some cells. Um, people can also use the uh, histone mark chip seek to help annotate the genome. And this is related to using hidden Markov models um, to say, okay, this is a gene that's an enhancer, that's a um, like a, a, a binding site for transcription factor, a binding site for, or, or it's an axon or intron, or whether it's a strong um, enhancer binding or a weak one, or things like that. Um, we can also use this to infer the transcription factor binding dynamics. For example, in cells where you don't have the transcription factor of interest known, you can just do differential histone marks and then look at those dynamic uh, mark locations you can figure out what transcription factors are enriched in there, whether motifs are there or TF binding are enriched there. It will help you understand what factors are important. 
And uh, very often, histomark's um, profiles are also coupled with gene expression analysis. Um, by the way, epigenetics should always be investigated in the context of gene expression or gene regulation. Only looking at epigenetic changes without gene expression differences tell us that you know, it has very little value. Um, and so because of the gene annotation, we, we had a lecture which was recorded from before this, right? Yeah, before the COVID-19 shutdown. Um, there is a hidden Markov model lecture. So hidden Markov model is um, we have independent um, IID process and uh, the Markov model, basically you have some hidden states and there's a transition between the hidden states, you know, how they transition from one to the other. But then at each hidden state, you will see a number of these observations that are coming depends on the hidden states, right? So um, the observations is what we can see. And based on that, we are trying to guess what it, the hidden states are. And so there is the initial probability, transition probability, and the emission probability as kind of objects in the hidden Markov model. And um, in the lecture, we talk about three problems. The first is we try to estimate what is the chance this type of observations will really happen. You know, for example, in the stock market, what is the chance that um, the stock will continue to go up for 40 days in a row and never go down, right? You can calculate that probability. Um, you can also infer the hidden states, which is if you have the whole observation, how can you guess what the, hit, the hidden states are? And that's where I think most of the computational biology problems um, are, are using um, in terms of a hidden Markov model. The third problem is what if we don't even, if we, we don't even provide the initial transition and the emission probabilities? Can you use the input data, enough data, to train those parameters? And uh, um, there is a solution for that. And by the way, for the homework, we provided with a link, and that link showed the, the Python implementation of all three uh, algorithms that you can take a look at. Uh, of course, depending on the specific question, you have to co configure this code to run for your data of interest. And there are a number of very interesting applications for hidden Markov model. Um, gene prediction are, you, are, are, are done um, in the early days for both mammalian genomes and also bacteria genomes. Annotation was done using hidden Markov models. Um, in this course, we talk about using hidden Markov models to annotate um, segments of the genome into promoters, enhancers, you know, genes, yeah, things like that. Um, we can also use a hidden Markov model to call copy number variations. You know, if you have probes around this region, they are suddenly uh, the lead are much more than other regions. You can call a consecutive region of high or low uh, read coverage as a co copy number variation change. You can also use it to call peaks. Um, in homework, in homework uh, five, we're asking you to implement a hidden Markov model. You can see from the data, it's almost like calling, you know, a, a, a positive peak with a negative peak and a positive peak. Um, so we are, we are annotating tab boundaries, but really it's like calling peaks. Yeah. Um, you can also use it to annotate CPG islands in the genome. You know, which region is a CPG island? You can use it. Um, people have also used it to predict protein secondary structure predictions. If you have the, uh, the, the, the observed the amino acid, can you guess whether uh, this stretch will be a, a helix or a strand or a loop on the protein structure. And, and the, the loop or the helix and the strand, that's the, that's the uh, hidden state. Yeah, so it's a really widely used algorithm. Uh, I, I think people should learn how to do this either in R or Python. Um, there are some standard modules you can use, but you know, we ask students to do a little bit of coding to see how it really works. Um, and then with epigenetics, uh, the next st stage, we're talking about the DNAs and ataxy. Um, this is a very high resolution way of mapping all the transcription factor binding sites without the knowledge of what transcription factor might be important. Um, so DNAs was invented earlier. It has very, very good resolution. It's just harder to do experimentally. So very few groups in the world can do this. Whereas with ataxy, it's very easy. Everybody can do it and also, um, very small amounts of starting materials are needed. So people are really now using a taxi to profile, you know, brain or embryos or 
um, tumor tissues now, which is really great. Um, we just want to be cautious about modeling footprint because both DNAs and the transposes enzyme used for attack have cutting biases. So you do not want to call footprint or transcription, sorry, transcription factor binding just because, or because there is a cutting bias. Uh, most of the time, people look for motif enrichment in the peaks, then they call it as a, the, the, the correct transcription factor binding size. And I think most of the time, they actually work better than using the footprint. Um, recently, there are a lot more machine you know, uh, efforts using machine learning approaches to impute the transcription factor binding based on either DNA data or a taxi data. So we will see more of this uh, in the coming years. Uh, and then we talk about higher order chromatin interactions using high C or some other kind of technologies um, to look at how chromatin interact with each other. Um, the very low level interaction is loops. So you, those usually are in the order of a few kb, maybe a 10 kb or 100 kb. Um, unfortunately, with the high C experiment, either the technology was not there or the sequencing was not deep enough. We're not seeing as many promoter enhancer loops uh, as we hoped. Most of what people see in high C are these interaction domains or the topologically associating domains where a lot of interaction happens within, but they are kind of isolated from another type domain where interactions are more frequent within, but not so much in between. Um, and so these high C uh, defined the TADs are, are quite interesting because they, these interactions are usually conserved between cell types and even conserved between species. Um, they do occasionally change, uh, th those are kind of interesting. And also at the even broader level, if we continue to look at high C interaction and zoom out, we will see this compartment A and B. So compartment B are the, 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 the regions close to the nuclear membrane and also close to the nucleolus, the center of the nucleus, where you have mostly heterochromatin, very compact regions, the genome are not active. Whereas the compartment A are the regions that are the transcriptional factories of the cell. A lot of genes are expressed. Housekeeping genes are mostly in compartment A. But occasionally, when the cell has to activate some region, um, the, the, the correct transcription factor, when it's really expressed, it can bind to the compartment B and kind of pull those regions into the compartment A and start transcription, transcription which is um, that's when you get really cell type specific gene expression. Um, and in order to form these type domains, you know, people try different computational models and now uh, this loop extrusion model is being acknowledged as the model where um, you have cohesins which are motors, so they always come in pairs. And once they see the chromatin, if they come in pairs, they just kind of keep looping. They have a directionality of their looping. And so, um, and then they keep looping until they meet two CTCF that are facing each other. And that's when the looping stops, right? So insulator, uh, CTCF forms an insulator. And so the motor will keep going until it stops at a CTCF binding site. And then the loop within will have more interactions with each other, but not with a nearby loop. Um, and then we talk about gene regulatory networks, you know, how you have feed forward loop or one uh, input or uh, controlling many genes or multiple transcription factor controlling one gene. And the, the fact that we have different modes of these uh, models of these regulatory network is to ensure that only with, you know, um, a thousand transcription factors, we can have very complex and dynamic behavior of gene regulation. Um, and uh, um, the last lecture, we talk about single cell attack seek. This is an area of really fast technology development. This is a new lecture. We didn't have this last year. Um, so the technologies, um, there's droplet based, there's a well based, and now there's also a split pool based. We focus mostly uh, on the droplet based because there's now 10x genomics turnkey solution. And once you get a big fast queue file, um, you have you know, read mapping, and now you can actually use mini map. You can map faster for a single cell. You can do standard peak calling. You can QC the overall sample compared to a bulk attack seek. Um, and then you can also QC individual cells to remove the, you know, the cells with low count or reads that are not in the peaks or promoters um, or a very low percentage of reads in the promoters. 
Um, and so with the QC of the cells, we can generate this peak by cell matrix, right? And then we can use the dimension reduction to reduce the cell, uh, the peak by cell count matrix from potentially hundreds of thousands of peaks into maybe only a hundred dimensions. And then you can use graph-based uh, approach to cluster the cells. And once they are clustered, you can visualize them just like TSNE or UMAP. You could optionally recall peaks in, within each cluster because sometimes the small cluster might have new peaks that you missed when you try to call peaks from all the data together. And, and then you can also call differential, peak, uh, differential peaks between different clusters or one cluster over all the other clusters. And um, we mentioned this very fast tool called Presto, which can really do this efficiently. Um, and you, you know, like a, a, a taxi, people are always interested in how they regulate nearby gene expression. Um, we recommend using, again, this regulator potential to weight all the nearby uh, single cell ataxic reads uh, to map it to the gene based on that uh, exponential decay of distance. And this way, you can convert the original peak by cell matrix into a gene by cell matrix. And it will be kind of like a, uh, a single cell RNA-seq data. And then you can integrate with uh, the, the single cell RNA-seq data that gen that's generated on the same sample with a CCA um, canonical correlation analysis and pretend that your attack seek and the single cell RNA seek are just two batches of the same type of data. Um, and then you can do labor transfer from the single cell RNA seq to annotate the single cell attack seek. You, you can also just use regulatory potential on the single cell attack seek data to directly go to cell type annotation. Um, and then um, we can also infer what transcription factors are important from a single cell attack seek uh, analysis um, by looking at either motif enrichment or overlapping with other transcription factor chip seek, um, either all the peaks or the differential peaks. Um, we also uh, introduced this algorithm. By the way, this is not just for single cell attack seek. Frankly, you don't need a single cell attack seek. Uh, you also, you don't even need a single cell RNA seek. Anytime you have a list of differential gene expression, the differentially expressed genes, say four or five hundred genes, you can use this LISA algorithm, which really use the public uh, epigenetic data and public chip seq motif and uh, chip seq binding to predict what transcription factors might be important for regulating your differentially expressed gene. That's how you know we use motifs, we use chip seq, we use open chromatin to help understand how genes are differentially regulated. So yeah. that's kind of a, uh, the, the lecture on the, the whole second module, all the lectures. I hope from this you can see how things fit together. Questions? <laughs>